Uh, today guys, I'm going to Evanston History Center I'm doing my documentation So, please watch my documentation please. today guys uh, history in Evanston I'm doing my tour here today today is May 9 3 o'clock in the afternoon so I'm gonna tour you around this history house here in Evanston so come and see guys that's the house here I'll show the family camera a little later on. Mm -hmm. The house was built around 1894-95 in a style which is called Chateauesque. Mm -hmm. And if you um, know us outside or down those suggestions of towers and so mm -hmm. on, it's meant in some ways to emulate a fine European country home. The architect is a gentleman named Henry Edward Ficken, and he designed houses for the well-off in the late 19th century. The style pre- uh, is previous to, uh, say, the prairie style Frank Lloyd Wright. So if you went out to the park, you'd see a somewhat different type of architecture yeah. there. But anyway, this is a house which is designed for persons of some means. The fellow who had it built was a guy named Reverend Robert Dickinson Shepherd. And Shepherd is a minister. He has also a degree in history from the University of Chicago and Masters. And he is, in the 1890s, when the house was built, uh, treasurer of Northwestern University, and he wants to become president. This is going to be a house suitable for the president of the great university. And anyway, Professor, I don't want to say he goes to have some money from somewhere else. Yeah. Very expensive <laughs> place. Uh, the house in the interior is mostly English Renaissance. We all see some other rooms that are more French in style. The style is not meant to be consistent, but rather it's supposed to be both comfortable and impressive. Um, for example, there are six fireplaces in the house, all poor, very handsome for $150,000. Oh my God. <laughs> now, give us some you know, comparison here. I'd say at that time, for a hundred, for five to ten thousand, you could just have a nice three bedroom house here in Evanston. It was a very pricey piece of property. Uh, the house property extended all the way over to the lake where you see the road that was ceded by Henry Gates Dawes to the city of Ellison South Dawes Park. Um, anyway, he sells it in 1909 to Henry Gates Dawes for $75,000, which makes me think he needed money pretty bad. He then leaves town. So it's in the hands of the Dawes family until 1960 when they willed it to Northwestern and subsequently Northwestern let the Ellison History Society use it as their headquarters. Oh, so, is it the headquarters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, the decoration is essentially that what it was under the Dawes on the first floor. The upstairs, which you'll see after a while, is not decorated the same way. But this is mostly the furnishings and the decor that the Dawes had. So anyway, let me talk a little bit about um, uh, Henry Gates Dawn. Well, about the, I mean, the architecture. You know, this is beautiful wood carving here and stuff. If they did this house at a time there was a lot of immigration from Europe, you could get wood carvers, I'm sure at that time, to do things like this. 
very elaborate sort of carving. Even the ends of these supports for the walkway have uh, faces carved into them. Uh, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the evangelist. <laughs> the uh, ceiling is probably done by some Italian master plasterers. Hmm. Again, you're very hard to get people to do that sort of thing today. Uh, anyway, uh, as I say, it is sold to Charles Gates Dawes in 1909. I want to talk a little about him. Dawes is uh, born into a family of seven children. He's born in 1865. He has four brothers and two sisters. And his father lived in Marietta, Ohio, which is a pretty little town in southeastern Ohio. His father had considerable means, and Dawes grows up very comfortably. Uh, at the age of 15, after completing high school, he goes to college, Marietta College in town. He graduates at the age of 19, fourth in his class. There are uh, 50. Nice house, you're not this one, but a nice place. And uh, around this time, he meets a rising Republican politician, William McKinley. McKinley will run for the presidency of the United States in 1896 against William Jennings Bryan. Dawes is a lifelong Republican. He becomes campaign manager for McKinley for Illinois. They carry Illinois. And Dawes is, and he wins the election. McKinley offers Dawes the post of controller of the currency, which is still around. It's a sub cabinet post, but it's still a pretty high post. And so from 1897 to 1901, they're living in D.C. Then they return here, and Dawes sets up a company for investment in banking with several of his brothers. It does quite well. He buys this house in 1909. Uh, skipping to a larger scale of things, a little bit. In 1914, World War I begins. We're going to talk about this in the United States, but it's a very big deal in Europe. It's been the centennial of this from 1914 to 18 in Europe. It dramatically changed European civilization. Um, not so much for us, but anyway, in 1914, there are two major sides, the Allies, England, France, and Russia, fighting Germany, Austria, and uh, Turkey, the central powers. Um, the United States, under President Woodrow Wilson, proclaims its neutrality. supply oh, service oh. conditions. He fires a guy and puts Dawes in charge. Figured Dawes, a successful businessman, could do well here. And Dallas does, in fact, increase the full arms, ammunition, food, et cetera, the United States Armed Forces. He ends the war with Brigadier General. Then he resigns his commission in 1919, comes back here. He sets up in his house his own little war memorial. So these busts were commissioned by Dawes to commemorate people with whom he worked in uh, Europe in the uh, Great War. So this one's sent to, this is a John Pershing. I won't go through all, but this is uh, uh, Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who's the supreme French commander. They're mostly British, French, and American generals. And he also said. The design uh, of the mansion here design, in Evanston. Uh, you can design your house like that on, <laughs> on one floor. Yeah. My no, God, that's no. too big. In many ways, there are similar things that you have in American kitchens in the, you know, around 1900 or so. This is a sink, which almost everybody in an urban household would have, made of enamel cast iron. It lasts forever. Right. Uh, heavy as lead. Things are very sturdy. It's bigger than most, but that's yeah. you know, the only difference. I'll show you a fancier sink for now. Most people are not here. The stove is natural gas, which is very common late 19th century in the United States. Uh, this is not their stove. It's an eight burner magic chef. They had a 10 burner sterns, but the same principles that are just a bigger cooking surface. But there are cooking ovens and heating, you know, you know warming ovens, that kind of stuff. The uh, females are on the countertops. Yeah. The people work here. Yeah. And apparently, a point of World War I, at least in the United States, that counters the cabinets and stuff above them came in. Mr. Dawes, he put in. There are two pantries. Yeah. Um, he did have the walls covered in this white tile, which makes some sense. He also put the ceiling, which is not so sense of how I think. Nice this ceiling. was out in the garage, or the carriage house. Apparently, there was supposed to be a room built above the porte cochere, 
but they never finished. I think the Reverend Shepherd mm -hmm. was the one. That's the covered walk. That's the storage area, guys. Yes, it was torn down by the yes, oh. uh, This would have been the room above ceilings, I guess those are the hard display rooms. This three dining room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the kitchen doesn't make any sense. Uh, you come out here, I'll show you. This this elaborate thing would be terrible to clean. Uh, you get a peek out here at the carriage house, or coach house. Um, I'm sorry I can't get a better view. This was actually built a few years, a year or two before the house, so it actually is a slightly different style by a guy named Charles Warren, who's the architect. But there are three bays in there, and then up above is an apartment. So if you want to just take a peek, you can. I'm sorry I can't. This is the storage area, guys. Well, I just love it. Lovely fireplace, nice carved wood. This is all dark stained oak in here and in the, the great hall. Uh, that is a musician's gallery up there. Uh, oh. The dogs didn't actually <laughs> use it much. They had the musicians they had on the first floor, but the kids used to like play up there. Uh, <laughs> Here is uh, something that's kind of interesting. This is an example of the limits of technology. This is a Tiffany Electrolier. And it is close, it's what's called locational lighting. In other words, your light sources are relatively weak. You know, some bulbs and you're pretty dim. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have a light source close to that which you want to illuminate. Yeah. And so, but it's a very expensive piece of, you know, stuff for the day. And then they have their service here. The table is circular because Mr. Dawes felt that was more democratic. Uh, it could be enlarged. I've never seen how they do this, but there are pie-shaped wedges oh which can really? add to make a bigger circle. Oh, wow. I don't know how they hold them on, so I was kind of curious about yeah. that. So it could be bigger than this. Um, is there a basement in this? Yes. The basement is all through the house and is basically the reference area. Oh, okay. So we do research. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, uh, cherry one. Uh, again, beautiful in this place. Very nice stuff. Wow. Um, at one time there was a room up here, which was the library guys uh, in the house. Uh, nice. Uh, so there was like a sort of a turret, like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you can see a picture of that glass yeah, ceiling and stuff there. Oh, oh like more like that, like that. Yeah, shackle yeah. Herbarium or something. Yeah, they yeah. were quite pretty, but they got rid of it. Anyway, this is where the family would hang out most of the time. Uh, the Dawes had two natural children, Rufus and Carolyn, and two adopted children, Virginia and Dana. So they like kids a lot. Mr. Dolly was just like sitting in his chair there, puffing away in his pipe. The kids had a board game there. Here's a pinball game, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a kind of uh, music player over here. It's really like a giant music box, I think. You crank it up, put mm -hmm. one of those discs on it, and it will play. Mm -hmm. I would think it was some kind of like a harpsichord, I'm not sure. <laughs> I uh, had this exact game. Okay, yeah. It was called Bagatel. Yeah, actually, yeah, it was, is this authentic? Excuse me? 16th century. I would be so. Uh, President McKinley was assassinated in 1901, shortly after his re-election. And the parent of the family was not very well off. So Mr. Dawes, uh, Mr. Dawes bought this, a fancy carriage and some other stuff, at very high prices from Mrs. McKinley. So in fact, he's transferring money to them. Uh, in the 19th century, the tradition was that the stuff in the White House belonged to the presidential family. Mm -hmm. So when they left, they'd take everything with them. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't like she was stealing it, but anyway. <laughs> Scared around here are some Tiffany lamps. And you notice the portrait gallery here. It's chronological. It's the oldest there and worked its way up from the late 18th century to, I would say, later 19th century. Those are the two portraits on the end are Mr. Dawes parents uh, right but this is sort of typical of well-off American families they would have portraits painted of ancestors and you know put them up in some yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the Dawes all loved music and Mr. Dawes actually was a composer 
he composed a melody in A in an improvisation. And the melody in A became a hit in the 1950s, and so I wrote all lyrics for it. It's all in the game, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like he needs one here like that. Yeah. But, you know, he, he was very talented for it. He had gone to Europe to renegotiate the reparations agreement. He comes back to the United States. This is a presidential election year. In the interwar period, there are three Republican presidents. The first one, elected in 1920, is Warren Harding, one of our handsomest presidents. He liked to fool around. Anyway, <laughs> he dies in office in 1923. This is a different style of architecture. It's the French. Right. We're much more, much more uh, bright and airy, I think, than the English Renaissance. Uh, anyway, Dawes comes back here in 1920, early 1929. Uh, the house in Senate has first blankets. That portrait above the mantle is Rufus Fearing Dawes, his natural son. He's born in 1890, he dies in 1912. So he dies quite young. Unfortunately, although he's very athletic, he's up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, swimming with some of his buddies there. It's a nice lake there. He has some sort of seizure and goes out of the ground. The dogs are absolutely devastated by this. So it's, it's